This morning's scripture reading is from John 18, verses 15 through 27. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside of the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for gathering all of us here this morning. I pray that above all else, we may grow ever closer to you, and that we would hear precisely what you'd have us to, and that we wouldn't just hear it and allow it to escape us the second that we leave, but that we would put it into practice in order to glorify your holy and precious name. In your name I pray. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to Mount Olives. Then Jesus said to them, we will all, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. This reading is from Matthew chapter 26, and I read it because it gives us, I think, a better context for the passage we just read. This morning we are continuing our series uh, on the book of John, and as we come to this moment, Jesus Christ has just been betrayed by Judas um, to those who would come to have him be killed. And as a result, the, t- the disciples are understandably um, in disarray. Now, that would make perfect sense, right? They would be in this place where Jesus Christ, who they believe would be the one who would overcome, who would conquer, who would, who would win every single battle and establish a new kingdom, is now gone. The one who loved them and cared for them and taught them and was there for them is gone. He's been arrested. And so as a result of that, you can imagine the emotions that they would have, right? How fearful they were, how, how in doubt they were. And so as a result, these guys are in disarray. And the text we read this morning focuses quite a bit on Peter's response to that. A response that Jesus predicted. Jesus, as we read, said, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to take place when they come and they take me away. And although we, we often focus on, on Peter Uh, and his denial. It is interesting to note Christ's declaration for Matthew. Because what does he say? As he's talking to the disciples, he says, when this happens, you will all fall away because of me that night. Jesus, as he was facing the the, the point of his coming, the, the reason he came to this earth, to be the, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as he's facing that, that point of sacrifice on the cross, he looks at his disciples and he says, 
on that very night, you all will deny me. You all will walk away from me. I really think this becomes an important starting point for our discussion because instead of focusing solely on the failure of Peter, which uh, I think can allow us in some ways to relegate Peter's failure to Peter's character, we are drawn into a broader experience and expectation of failure. What I mean by that is Jesus expected the very human response to disarray brought on by disappointment, doubt, and fear. And he believed that that very human response would be denial. I find this to be an incredibly informative truth revealed in this narrative by John. And I want you to notice something. As John tells this story, he interweaves Jesus' calm, faithful witness with Peter's failed witness. One commentator put it this way, Jesus stands up to his questioners and denies nothing, while Peter cowers before his questioners and denies everything. Another one notes that Jesus' twice-repeated self-identification in the garden to those who came to arrest him as I am contrasts completely Peter's twice-repeated denial I am not. Jesus Christ at this point realizes the response of humanity when they're disappointed, when they face doubt, when they have fear, that it's denial. And yet Christ sets for us in this story the example of what we do in those moments, what we're called to do in those moments. Christ's faithful responses speak to what we can expect from him. And in reality, Peter's response reveals how we inevitably at times respond. I say that because what I want us to realize this morning is that the reality is we all fail Jesus sometimes. Our failures may not be as dramatic or as well known as Peter's failure. But whether by words or by actions, we've all denied Christ as our Savior and our Lord. If Jesus, if if Peter facing this, if Peter, who was the leader of the disciples, the, the one who had walked with Jesus in the midst of the pressure, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the doubt, in the midst of the turmoil, would deny Christ himself, we have to realize that this is in us too. We are not immune. But as we look at Peter's failure, I really believe we can look at it and, and, and trace four missteps that lead to it. And in so doing, begin to realize that those steps can lead to our failure also. Our denial in the face of doubt. Our denial in the face of desperation will come about if we follow the same pathway that Peter took. The first misstep I see Peter taking is, like Peter, we fail to understand God's ways and impose our ways on him. Peter could not wrap his mind around the concept of a Messiah who would suffer and die. You guys remember last week, I referenced Peter's response to rebuking Christ after Jesus had talked to the disciples. He talked to the disciples and he he gave them the whole plan. He, He laid it out for them. He said, I want you guys to understand this, that, that I am going to suffer and I am going to die. And if you remember, G, at that point, Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. And basically says, no, that's not the plan. Stop saying that. That's not true. But I want you to look at how that exchange unfolds. And particularly, I want you to look at the last line that Christ delivers in his response to Peter. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. 
what was it that caused Peter to receive the rebuke of, Jesus, of Christ in this moment? He said, you're setting your eyes on the things of man and not on the things of God. Jesus several times repeated the same message about his impending death. And, and, the, and the disciples just simply could not conceive of such a thing. They envisioned the Messiah as the one who would conquer Rome and rule over Israel on the throne of David. They simply could not picture the Messiah as the lamb, the one who would die, the one who would suffer. Because they had a different plan. They had a different idea. They believed in victory a different way. They believed in winning a different way. Because they had their eyes on the things of man and not on the plan of God. This quite often is us. When you think God has to work in a certain way. That God doesn't conform to your expectations and to your plans and what you want to have happen. Honestly, when you really spend time around Christians, when you really spend time in the church and you live the life with believers, you begin to understand this really does become the crux of why so many people deny Jesus, why so many people walk away from Jesus. I have a plan. If God really cared about me, he would do it this way. He would do it that way. And when we don't get things the way we want things, it's when we deny him. Instead of giving ourselves completely and totally to him. See, the truth is, part of the problem for Peter was he had a plan that Jesus was not aligning with. And so when it didn't turn out the way he wanted it, he didn't understand. And he was fearful, and he doubted, and he denied. How many of you realize that that's a trap that we can fall into? That we ourselves have a plan that we think is the way in which he should answer us, what he should give us, how he should heal us, how he should provide for us. And when we don't get it the way we want it, out of our fear and out of our doubt, we deny him. There's so many Christians that I've known over the years that have simply walked away because they're unwilling to, re to accept the will of the Father. It is in accepting God's will that you find a peace that transcends all circumstances. God loves you. God has a plan for you as his child. It may not be the plan you have. It may not be the plan you want. It may not be the plan you like. But he has a plan. And rest in the reality of that plan. Secondly, like Peter, we fail to recognize our own weaknesses so that we trust in ourselves and not in the Lord. This is one of the things you see really clearly about Peter. Peter really believed in himself. Peter really believed that he could stand. Peter really believed that he had what it took. Back in John 13, he declared definitively to Christ, I will follow you wherever you go. In fact, I will die for you, he declared. That's, that exchange is recorded in Luke, and, and in, that, in, in, in Luke, he even added, he says, I'll go to prison for you, I will die for you, I'll go wherever you want me to go. In fact, look at, look at the words that I shared in the passage of Matthew that I just read. He responds to Jesus and he says, though they all fall away because of you, I will never deny you. Think about the context of that, what he's saying there. Jesus is looking at all the disciples. They're all sitting there. And he's saying, you guys are all going to deny me. And Peter stands up and goes, he goes, they may all deny you. These other guys, they might deny you. But I never will. This is how incredibly confident Peter was in his own ability to stand up. And then simply the servant girl asks, are you not one of his disciples? And his response is, I, I'm not. He's standing around with a group of people, kind of in the crowd, just hanging out. Are you not one of his disciples? 
<laughs> I'm not. Literally hours after he declared his total fidelity to Christ, he denies him. One of the reasons the message in John's writing of chapter 18 is so important is that trusting in your own commitment and devotion for, for the Lord is a sure way to fail. Believing that simply I can do this, I can accomplish this, I have what it takes, I have, I, have the, I have the strength, I have the intellect, I have the ability to be what God calls me to do, to what God calls me to be and to do what God calls me to do is a sure way to find failure. Proverbs, eight, uh, Proverbs 16 verse 18 rightly says, pride goes before the fall. But when we are weak and we know it, that's when we're strong. A lot of us know that, that, that in our weakness, he is made strong. We understand that idea, we, 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 or we hear that idea, we, we quote that idea. But how exactly does that work? What, what does that really mean to us as we're trying to live a life for Christ? One that is anchored in something other than our own, our own ability to, to do the right thing, to think the right way, in our own self-discipline. Look at what Paul says when was God's response when he prayed for the suffering he was enduring to be removed. You remember that passage where he talks about he had a thorn in his side, he prayed that it would be removed three different times. And here's the response, here's the total response that, that, that God gives him as he prays for that. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of all my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, we've, we've heard this before, but I want you guys to understand what, what is, the, what is the, the direction that God is leading us as it relates to fighting this strength. Peter's reliance on his own strength, even his arrogance and devotion, was the source of his failure. But God gives us in this direction to, 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 Paul, or to, to Paul the key to strength through it all. He says, my grace is sufficient. Now, for a lot of us as Christians, we, we hear that and we've quoted that and, 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 we, and we love that idea, but you have to understand the, the, the truth behind it that empowers us to find strength in him. One of the best ways to understand God's declaration there, my grace is sufficient, is to understand it from the context of my grace is everything. My grace is complete. My grace is total. My grace is everything. And why it's important for us to understand it in that context is this. We have to realize we have nothing. We can contribute nothing. It's not in us. There is nothing in us that is able to make this happen. The reason this is so important is because the application is a realization of the utter dependency we have on his grace. And when we come to that point, the reason that empowers us is because then we understand who he is. His grace empowers you. His grace saves you. His grace allows you to breathe your next breath, to walk your next step, to accomplish anything. There is absolutely nothing that you can accomplish of good. There is absolutely nothing that you can accomplish of any eternal value or benefit that comes from your own ability, your own mind, your own talent, your own flesh. His grace is everything. His grace is everything. I say this from a very personal place in life because as I've lived 30 some years as a pastor, and I've come across pastor after pastor after pastor, and I've found failure after failure from guys over and over and over again. 
I've discovered that one of the primary reasons why pastors fail in ministry is because they have so identified with their success and failure in ministry. They believe what they've accomplished or didn't accomplish is the result of something they did or didn't do. Their talent, their ability. I've sat and talked so many times with, with, with pastors. I had one conversation with a pastor, one of the largest churches in, in America at one point. And he began to tell me about all the things that his church was doing and how every conversation we had, it was so tied to his ability, his talent, his, his, his oratory, his leadership. And as I looked at him, I said, I said, man, that is awesome. But one of the things I've seen that destroys most ministries is the pride of the leadership. The belief that what they're doing is accomplishing what God's doing. And that ministry failed. On the flip side, I've known pastors who have so identified with what they see as failure that they can't live with themselves because they believe they haven't done enough, they haven't been good enough, they haven't accomplished enough. I had another friend of mine who was ministry, who actually was very instrumental in Mercy Hill Church coming into existence, who could never live with the quote-unquote success he had in ministry because it never was quite enough. And he identified with his failure so deeply that eventually he killed himself. Too often we in ministry, and when I say we in ministry, I don't mean just us pastors, I mean all of us. All of us as we walk in faith, identify with our ability to accomplish. You have none. It's not your talent. It's not your, it, it, it's not your intelligence. It's not because you're so spiritual. All that we have is by the grace of God. And so we trust in him and we rest in him and we find our completion in him. The problem that Peter had was he believed that he could do it and he needed to realize it was only by his grace anything could be done. You can't do it. It's not in you. So you have to press in and you have to come to him. And I think that leads us to the, to the third misstep that Peter had that we have to learn from because I think they are very closely related. We fail to recognize the spiritual battle that we're engaged in and as a result we fail to pray as we should. This is a very closely this is very this idea is very closely linked to the failure of Peter and his failure to pray. Luke records the hours before Christ's arrest in the garden with his disciples and it says this When Jesus came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, we all remember this story, right? There was the, the, on the eve of Jesus Christ going to the cross, he's gathered with the disciples and he goes into a place secluded to pray. And he says, guys, let's spend some time in prayer. Remember what happened? When Jesus arose from prayer, he came to the disciples And he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Do you notice the quote, the the connection that Jesus Christ makes here between prayer and temptation? Do you ever take note of that? Do you ever ever see as, as on the eve of Peter in his failure, being tempted to give in to his fear, tempted to give in to his doubt, Jesus is giving him instruction as to how to stand and he fails in that instruction. And the instruction he gives is pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Why, what is prayer? This is one of the things that I think we as Christians need, need to really kind of press into. We talk about a lot of different terms. We lose, use a lot of different words, but you have to press into the reality of this. Have you ever thought about prayer? And I've said this before over the years. Prayer is probably the most purely spiritual thing that a person can do. Think about it, right? Because if it's not, it's just craziness. Like it, it, It's literally, it, you're kind of insane. Because what you're saying is, I can close my eyes and I can pray some things in my head and expect something to happen out there. 
right? That's what prayer is. Or I can stand up here and I can pray something out, out loud and somehow whatever I do here affects things in the, in the real world. We, we pray because we think it affects things in the real world, right? It seems crazy to think, think, think words in your head and think it's going to affect things in the real world, right? That's not a natural process at all, is it? It is entirely a spiritual process. So why are we as believers called to step into this spiritual process if not for the fact that we're in a spiritual battle? We have to realize that we are in a spiritual fight. We have to realize that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Peter didn't understand that Satan was out to get him And that this hour belonged to the power of darkness. And as a result, he failed to pray at that crucial time in the garden. So often, like Peter, we react to difficult situations from the physical or human perspective. Rather than realizing we are in a spiritual battle with unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. I understand that We get a little uncomfortable when we push into this place, but that's part of our problem then, isn't it? Because we don't live with that understanding. And so therefore, we don't begin to fight the battles where they need to be fought, which is in the spiritual realms. Remember, Ephesians makes it clear that the spiritual darkness that we're reading about that's targeting Jesus Christ for death doesn't only have its sights on him. Ephesians says, be strong in the Lord. It says, and in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. You know, this, you know this, is the, this, is the, this is kind of the preamble to that whole conversation about putting on the full armor of God, right? We all love the, 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 that, that, that illustration of putting on the armor of God, right? We, we were in our Sunday school classes and we were able to put on the shield and the helmet and, and then we go and this is what it is and it's all real cool. We had coloring books about it and the whole deal. We all kind of accept that really easily. But how many, how many of us read over the read-in? How many of us read over what it's, what it, what's being laid out as what it's battling against? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil. Do you realize that's your battle every day? That's your battle every day. Whether you want to accept it or not doesn't change the truth of it. And as a result, we keep battling on the spiritual level, thinking in in, in natural means, and God has given us the spiritual weapon of prayer, of his word, of his truth. Do not fail to recognize the spiritual battle you are in, and therefore fail to fight that battle in the spiritual realm. Be in prayer. Be on your guard. Be spiritually strengthened in the Lord through his word, through his truth. Because if you don't, it's likely you'll fail. And finally, like Peter, we fail to fear God more than we fear man. I think it is unquestionable that Peter's denial flowed out of him being gripped by the fear of what would happen if he didn't deny. His fear of ostracization, his fear of arrest, his fear of death. In spite of all of his, in spite of all of the times he declared, I'll go to prison for you, I'll die for you. As he was in that place, he was afraid of what man would do to him. And he denied Christ because he was fearful of what man could do. Jesus set the standard for Peter. And he set the standard for us when he declared in Matthew chapter 10, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body 
in hell. Christ in this sets a pathway for freedom too few Christians walk. Because with a focus on the things of man, they fear the reprisals of man. But when we fear God with a holy, reverent fear, we are set free to stand in ways we otherwise would not. I want you to understand that. I want you to hear that. And I'm not sure that I, that I communicated as, as well as I wanted to. You guys need to understand that as Christians, there is a freedom that is found when you no longer fear man. You are, you are set free in a way that is, that is, um, that is uncommon. You, you are set, way, set free in a way that no one else can, can, can discover, no one else can live in other than those who stand before God and say, you've got it all. You're in charge of it. You've got my plan. You've got my future. You've got my everything. This is really clearly the, the contrast we can see between Peter and, and Jesus, right? Jesus stood there and he's like, whatever. I'm following the pathway of God. He's got my plan. It doesn't matter what you guys think or do. Peter lived bound by fear of man. And it wasn't until he got to the point where he was able to say, I don't care what man thinks. I only care what God thinks that he ever found freedom. And he did. He, he found that freedom after, after Acts chapter 2. Peter, who was standing there, and because he was afraid of the reprisals of man, he denied who Christ was. He denied knowing Christ. He denied a relationship with Christ. But after Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, Acts chapter 2 comes, the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Now understand, this is post-Pentecost. After Pentecost, after the Spirit of God comes upon the disciples, Peter then goes out in the streets and he starts preaching. And about three chapters later, he is standing before the magistrates. He's standing before the leadership who had just killed Jesus, who could arrest Peter, who could beat Peter, who could, who could kill Peter. He's standing before them and they say to him, do not go and preach about Jesus. Do not go and talk about Jesus. You know what he responded with? Am I to obey God or obey man? What empowered him to stand and make that declaration? Because he feared God more than he feared man. There is a freedom found for the believer when they realize that our lives are in God's hands, not man's hands. And as a result of that, we can stand in a way that we otherwise could not. We can stand firm. We can overcome failure. What I say is, I, I, I love how, how John, as he writes this, has interwoven the, the nature of the story of Jesus with the nature of the story of Peter. Because as he does that, he sets before us Jesus as the example. He sets before us Jesus as the pathway. He sets before us Jesus as the way we're supposed to go. Now, throughout this entire series, we've been talking and we've been saying that the value of the book of John is it shows us Jesus. It shows us his nature. It shows us his life. It shows us his, his, his teaching. It shows us his work. It shows us his death. It shows us how we should live. And this is exactly what is revealed in this chapter. It becomes really clear. The reality may be that we will all at times fail Jesus. But what is also true is that we can always trust our faithful Savior who never fails. And he gives us the example on how to follow him on that pathway. Look how Christ's calm courage stands in contrast to Peter's compromise at every single point that we've brought out. Whereas Peter failed to understand God's plan and imposed his own, Jesus knew the Father's plan and submitted to it even though it was painfully difficult. Peter failed because he did not understand God's ways, but Jesus knew that he was sent to this earth to go to the cross. And even though it was going to, it was going to be suffering, even though it was going to be death, even though it was going to be hard, what did he do? 
He looked at Peter when Peter told him, when Peter uh, uh, confronted uh, the, the, the servant of the soldiers, he healed him and said, what am I not to drink of the cup that the Father has for me? Jesus set the example and said, no matter how hard it is, follow the pathway of the Father. Whereas Peter pridefully relied on his own strength, Jesus always depended on the Father. Peter failed because he did not recognize his own weaknesses and thus trusted in his commitment. But as a man, Jesus Christ to show, showed us how we should live. He did not trust in himself, but in the Father. We've talked about this in the past in John. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. And as a result, Jesus was able to conquer the enemy. He set for us the example and said, whatever God has for me, I'll do it. Whereas Peter failed to recognize his true enemy, Jesus knew the enemy and wrestled in prayer to gain the victory before the crisis hit. Peter failed to recognize the spiritual battle, and so he failed to pray. But Jesus won the victory in the garden as he overcame the powers of darkness through prayer. This is one of the things that you can actually almost see unfolding in just a, 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 a simple sentence, but it actually happened over hours of time as Jesus Christ was in that garden wrestling in prayer with what he was about to face. The Bible records that he, 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 was, so, he, he was so grieved, he was, he was so struggling that he, that he sweated drops of blood. And he prayed, Father, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me. But he prayed through to the point, but not my will, but your will be done. In prayer, he fought the battle and he became that which Christ what God set him out to be. And whereas Peter was overcome by his fear of man, Jesus feared God, not man, and bore faithful witness to sinners. Peter, fe fe Peter feared man, not God, and thus failed as a witness. But Jesus feared God, not these powers, and thus bore faithful witness. Whether, be whether before the high priest or Pontius Pilate, he never wavered because he knew that his face, fate was not in them, but in the hands of the Father. Remember how Jesus answers Pilate in the very next chapter, in chapter 19. And he says with these words, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. He stood before Pilate and was able to give a, 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 a great witness of truth because he realized Pilate did not hold his fate in his hands, but his fate was in the hands of the Father. He sets the example. He understood his life was in God's hands and not man's. And he calls us to live in that same way. John shows us Jesus. He shows us his character and his nature. And in that, he provides forth a pathway to stay strong, to live fearless, and to follow God's pathway for us. Each one of us needs to understand in ourselves, we will fail. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, because of the work of Jesus Christ, we have the ability to stand in him, to be what he calls us to be, to live the life he has for us. I don't know about you, but one of the things I've learned over the years is that Jesus has a better way for me. The plan of the Father is better than the plans that I make for myself. And it isn't until I've allowed myself to be thrown by faith into that place that I discover the beauty that God has for me in my life. It is a leap of faith. But when we begin to structure things the way we believe they should be done, when we begin to rely on the things of man, when we begin to rely on our strength and, and we worry about others, we are left with a life that we construct. And I've learned I'm not very good at making a life. But God is. We can, we can limit our failure 
by following the path of Christ. We can live in a place of freedom like you've never known before by following the path of Christ. You can be set free from fear by following the path of Christ. This is what's before us today. And this is the opportunity we have.